Well, hello again. Welcome again to another episode of Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded. And I'm your host, Irv Risch, on Internet Radio. And today, we're going to be finishing up our study in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be coming to the practical section uh, of this book. And it's uh, chapter 6. And in fact, that's the chapter that I'll be starting next Monday uh, in my scripture reading meeting that we have on Monday night. So with that said, we're going to finish our, our uh, book up today. So let us start our uh, session. Ephesians, the Practical Section, and Chapter 6, by Daniel C. Snadden. The Practical Section this part of the epistle contains practical instructions and exhortations for the believer. The practical issues discussed should flow from the lives of believers who comprehend the magnificent doctrinal truths expounded in the first half of the epistle. Ephesians 4 verses 1-3, Paul begins this section in verse 1 with an exhortation to walk worthy of our vocation, that is, our calling or summons from God, being chosen by God. We have to walk before God and men with all lowliness, humility, meekness, gentleness, long-suffering, and patience, making allowances for one another, verse 2. These attributes are to characterize our walk. In the first three chapters we are living in the heavenlies. In the last three we are in the church and in the world. Verse 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This suggests giving diligence and earnestly striving. We are to keep this unity, not make it. See Ephesians 2, Oneness, the Holy Spirit indwelling and empowering each believer is the true source of unity. Ephesians 4 verses 4 to 6, three spheres are suggested in the next three verses, the inward sphere, the outward sphere, and the sphere of creation. Let us look at each more closely, for our own purposes here. Let's omit the words, there is. The inward sphere, Ephesians 4 verse 4, one body, one spirit. This would be the innermost circle. They represent that which is inward and not seen. In the earlier chapters, the body is the great theme. However, men on earth never see it. What men see instead is a baffling array of bodies, each claiming to be the body. This one body is vitalized by one spirit and looks forward to one hope. The unseen Holy Spirit is the prominent one here. The outward sphere, Ephesians 4 verse 5, this is the sphere that concerns the Lord Jesus, who is the outward expression of the Godhead. Jesus as Lord is a prominent theme in the end. See Romans 10 verses 9 and 1 Corinthians 12 colon 3, and Philippians 2 verse 11. Indeed, Jesus is Lord. 1. Baptism The big question here is, is this referring to a water baptism or the baptism of the Spirit? There are good scholars on both sides. 1. Faith This is the common faith that all believers express, in contradistinction to the religions of the Gentiles and the laws of the Jews. The The sphere of creation, Ephesians 4 verse 6, the most important unity is the seventh. This number in Scripture usually expresses completion or perfection. One God and Father of all. See Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3. The fatherhood of God extends beyond the Christian sphere to the larger unity of creation. He is God over all, blessed forever. See Romans 9. A realization of the truth of these seven unities is expected to lead us into a greater unity with each other. Ephesians 4 verse 7, Consider the diversity of the members of the body. After instructing us concerning the oneness, unity, of the body, Paul now sets forth the diversity of its members. The source of all gifts is Christ. The channel of ministry is the diversity of gifts. The purpose of ministry is the edification of the body. In verse 7, we have the expression, But unto each one of us was the grace given. To every believer is this grace given. Every believer has been given a spiritual gift and God has given the grace, power, strength, 
and wisdom to use that gift for His glory and the building up of the church after. Ephesians 4 verses 9-10, these verses are parenthetical and are often interpreted in different ways. The lower parts of the earth is a point of conflict. Some teach that, the lower parts of the earth is referring to the earth itself. Others believe this to be a reference to Hades. Some feel that the Incarnation answers the question. Many more take the view that the death of Christ is sufficient to answer the question. Perhaps the last of these answers is the right one. Ephesians 4 verse 11, the true and only basis for Christian ministry is given in this verse. It is not a question of education, degrees, ecclesiastical ordination, or man's authorization. The way the church is built up is through the gifts given to it by the risen Christ. Consider the qualifications, or rather lack thereof, of the disciples. Some were fishermen, one was a tax collector, they were for the most part Galileans. They had no schooling, no college degrees, and no human ordination, but they were gifts from the Lord. Despite their unqualified status, humanly speaking, they turned the world upside down. Note the order here, first, grace is given to each one, Ephesians 4 verse 7, then, gifts are given to men, Ephesians 4 verse 8, and finally, these gifted men are given to the church, Ephesians 4 verse 11. In this verse, there is mention of apostles and prophets, but they are no longer needed. Evangelists preach the gospel. The work of the evangelist is to seek lost souls and win them for Christ. Pastors and teachers, these gifts are closely linked together. This is the only mention of pastor in the end. In other places the same word is rendered, shepherd, see John 10 verse 11 and Hebrews 13 verse 20. This illustrates the tender care of the shepherd for the sheep, this is the vital gift of the pastor. The teacher is gifted to bring instruction in an orderly way. Ephesians 4 verses 12 to 14, for the perfecting of the saints, the purpose of these gifts is to equip the believers to serve the Lord, and one another, so that the church may be built up. It would appear that as the gifted men use their gifts and the body is edified, each member grows and functions in his God-given place, and the corporate body develops into spiritual maturity. The object of this ministry by gifted men is now brought out in verse 13. It is, until we attain, or arrive at three things, 1, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, 2, a perfect or mature man, a full-grown man, and, 3, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This would apply both to the individual and the corporate body. Verse 14 goes on to say that we henceforth be no longer children, babes, infants. It is not God's will that we should remain spiritual babes. He wants us to grow up. Paul goes from speaking of the picture of the babe to speaking of the picture of the sea. Maybe he has a piece of driftwood in mind here. Ephesians 6 The truths of the first nine verses of this chapter are a continuation of the theme introduced in chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, the Spirit-filled wife is subject to her husband. In this chapter, we learn that Spirit-filled children obey their parents, see Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 3. Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 3. The phrase, in the Lord, is interesting. Paul undoubtedly has the Christian family in view. Christian children should obey their parents with the attitude that they are obeying the Lord. Secondly, it means that they should obey in all matters which are in accordance with the will of God. In the case of being ordered to do that which is contrary to the will of God, they should continuously refuse and suffer any consequences meekly. Paul gives four reasons why children should obey their parents. It is right, Ephesians 6 verse 1, this is a basic principle that is built into the family structure, that those who are immature, impulsive, and inexperienced should submit to the authority of parents who are older and wiser. It is scriptural, Ephesians 6 verse 2, Paul quotes Exodus 20 verse 12, which says, Honor thy father and thy mother. This is the first of the Ten Commandments with a promise attached. It calls for children to love, respect, and obey their parents. 
It is in the best interest of the children, Ephesians 6 verse 3, that it may be well with thee. We can see all around us the effects of the lack of instruction and correction. Some children are personally miserable and socially intolerable. For obedience to one's parents, the Jewish child was promised, length of days, Ephesians 6 verse 3, in this age, a life of discipline and obedience is conducive to good health and longevity. Ephesians 6 verses 4 to 8. Paul continues his instruction in the domestic sphere by giving advice to fathers, Ephesians 6 verse 4. They are, not to provoke their children to anger. They must not make unreasonable demands upon them. They must not treat them with undue harshness. They must not be constantly nagging them. On the contrary, they should be brought up with discipline and correction, verbal or corporal. They should be admonished, i.e. warned, rebuked, and reproved, in the Lord. The one who administers the discipline must always remember that he is acting as a representation of God. The third, and final, sphere of submission in the Christian household concerns servant submission to their masters. The first duty of the servant is to obey. Ephesians 6 verse 5 reads, Servants, be obedient. Secondly, the servant should be respectful, acting with fear and trembling. This does not mean that they should act with cowering servility or abject terror, but rather it means that they should treat their masters with respect and a fear of offending the Lord as well as employees. Thirdly, the servant's service should be conscientious, in singleness of heart. Fourthly, the servant's work should be done as unto Christ. A servant's performance should not be determined by the geographical location of the master. Instead, it should be determined by the presence of the ever-present Lord. Those who serve their earthly master well are serving Christ and doing the will of God, Ephesians 6 verse 6. The monetary reward may not be commensurate with the service rendered to our earthly master, but in the future it will be recognized and rewarded by the Lord Himself. Ephesians 6 verses 9 to 20. Masters should be guided by the same general principles as servants. They should be kind, fair and honest. They should abstain from threatening and abusive language. In disciplining their servants they should remember that they also have a master in heaven who does not recognize that which is an earthly distinctive, Ephesians 6 verse 9. In Ephesians 6 verse 10, the Apostle is drawing a close to his letter. He makes a final appeal to the family of God as soldiers of Christ saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of his might. The spiritual believer is engaged in total warfare. The hosts of Satan are committed to hinder, obstruct, and totally destroy the individual believer, think of Adam and Eve. The closer a believer walks with the Lord, the more he will experience the savage attacks of Satan and his hosts. Consider David, see Acts 16 and Matthew 10 verse 2. In our own strength we are no match for the devil see James 4 verse 7. Hence, we are exhorted to be strong in the Lord and to draw continually from the inexhaustible resources of His power. Paul issues his second command here, saying, Put on the whole armor of God. The believer must be completely armed to stand. Paul mentions this three different times. The devil has many modes of attack. These include discouragement, frustration, confusion, moral failure, doctrinal error, worldly pleasure, and mediocrity. If he cannot disable us by one method, he will try another. In Ephesians 6 verse 12, we are called to wrestle. This battle is not against human enemies, but against demonic powers, hosts of fallen angels, and evil spirits who wield tremendous powers. These wicked spirit beings can oppress and harass the believers. He need not be anxious by their presence if he puts on the whole armor of God. Paul names some of our spirit enemies, which include principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. These evil beings are present in the heavenly places, the air. Ephesians 6 verse 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Notice it is the whole armor. This is mentioned twice here, 
see Ephesians 6 verse 11. We must put the whole armor of God on if we expect to stand when the conflict reaches its fiercest intensity. The evil day is the day of attack. The armor is for the front. Satanic opposition comes in waves. We never know when the attack will come, hence the importance of having all the armor on at all times. There are seven pieces of armor. 1. The first piece of armor mentioned is the girdle or belt of truth. Every Christian should be armed with the truth of God's Word. Everything moral, spiritual, doctrinal, and ethical should be tested by the truths of the Word. Jesus said, I am the truth. This is the believer's first line of defense. Example, the Lord in the wilderness. 2. The second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Every believer is clothed with the righteousness of God, see 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He also should manifest integrity and purity of personal life. When a believer is clothed in practical righteousness, he is impregnable. David put on the breastplate of righteousness, see Psalm 7 verses 3 to 5. The Lord wore it at all times. See Isaiah 59 verse 17, which asks, Which of you convicteth? 3. The soldier's feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Ephesians 6 verse 15. This suggests a readiness to go forth with the gospel of peace, as a literal invader into enemy territory. How beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, see Romans 10 verse 5. Take my feet. Swift and beautiful for thee. 4. The soldier is also commanded to take the shield of faith in Ephesians 6 verse 16. By doing so, he is able to protect himself against the flaming arrows from hell. Faith here is from confidence both in the Lord and in His Word. When temptation harasses, when circumstances are adverse, when doubts assail, when all seems lost, faith looks up and says, I believe God. 5. The believer must put on a helmet, Ephesians 6 verse 17. The helmet God provides is a helmet of salvation, see Isaiah 59 verse 17. No matter how fierce the battle, the believer should be undaunted, knowing that ultimate victory is sure. The assurance of eventual deliverance should inspire him and so prevent retreat or surrender. If God be for us, who can be against us? See Romans 8 verse 31. 6. Furthermore, believers must take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The classic example of this is our Lord's use of this sword in His encounter with Satan in the wilderness. He quoted the Word of God three times, under the direction of the Spirit. This was sufficient to discourage him from further attack. Example, Mooney Girl. 7. Finally, Ephesians 6 verse 18 speaks of, praying always with all prayer. Prayer is not mentioned as part of the armor, but every believer at all times should be enveloped in an attitude of prayer. Prayer should be done without ceasing. We must be praying always, see 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. The believer should use all kinds of prayer, praying, with all prayer. This should include both public and private prayer, deliberate and spontaneous prayer, along with supplication and intercession. There should also be confession and humiliation, along with praise and thanksgiving. The Spirit should inspire the believer's prayers. Of what use are formal, ritualistic prayers against the forces of hell? There must be vigilance in prayer. We must be always, watching thereunto. We must guard against complacency and carelessness. Prayer requires keenness, alertness, and concentration. There also must be perseverance in prayer, with all perseverance. We must keep on asking, seeking, and knocking, see Luke 11 verse 9. Finally, supplication should be made for all saints. All believers are engaged in the conflict and need the supportive prayers of fellow soldiers. Ephesians 6 verse 19 says, Pray for me. Paul is in prison at this time. He did not ask for prayer for an early release, 
rather he asked that they would pray that the opportunity would be given him to declare the gospel. Usually ambassadors are granted diplomatic immunity from arrest and imprisonment. No such treatment was given Paul. He considers himself an ambassador in bonds, he considered himself to be the prisoner of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 6 verse 20. Even in chains he asks them to pray that he may open his mouth boldly and speak the full revelation of God. Ephesians 6 verses 21-24 These verses draw this remarkable letter to a conclusion. Paul mentions that he is sending Tychicus to them to let them know how he was faring. Tychicus' task was twofold. He wanted first to tell them of Paul's welfare in prison and second to encourage their hearts, allaying any unnecessary fears. In Ephesians 6 verse 23, he desires that his readers may have peace and love with faith. Peace would garrison their hearts in every circumstance of life. Love would enable them to worship God and work with one another. Faith would empower them for exploits in Christian warfare. Finally, in Ephesians 6 verse 24, the beloved apostle prays that the grace of God will be the position of every true believer. The Roman prison no longer holds its noble inmate. The beloved apostle has entered into his reward, and has seen the face of his beloved Lord. But his letter is still with us, as fresh and alive as it left his heart and his pen. This possibly is one of the most wonderful and majestic spiritual letters ever written. Ephesians 5 verse 33, Paul closes this particular section on marriage by saying that a husband must love his wife as he loves himself. And that the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Children and Parents, Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 4. Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 3, children are directly addressed in the section. God is speaking directly to them himself. He is not relaying a message through their parents. The message is that they are to obey their parents. One of the characteristics of the last days is disobedience, see 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 2. This has come about through many avenues, among them, the complete disregard for the authority of God's Word and the teaching of the evolutionary philosophy, which denies God's power. There are three reasons why children should obey their parents. It is right, Ephesians 6 verse 1, even Jesus, who was God incarnate, was subject to his earthly parents. This is a lovely example for all children. Out of obedience, Ephesians 6 verse 2, Paul quotes from the Ten Commandments, saying, Honor your father and mother. It is not a reluctant, grudging obedience that God expects, but an obedience that will honor father and mother. For the promise that says, that it may be well with you, and that you may live a long time. Ephesians 6 verse 3, material blessings were promised to the children of the OT for obedience to their parents. This is repeated here to any children. God will bless children who obey their parents. Ephesians 6 verse 4, fathers must also take heed to God's word and exercise wisdom in discipline. Children are not to be provoked to anger by inconsistency and overcorrection. Children are to be brought up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Servants and Masters, Ephesians 6 verses 5 to 9. Ephesians 6 verse 5, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters, obeying them as you would obey Christ. Perhaps not in the same harsh way, these instructions apply to employees and employers today. We must serve our employer with respect in the same way we would serve Christ. Ephesians 6 verse 6, We must serve faithfully, not only when they are watching, but also when they are not. We are not to serve with the idea of winning their favor. We must serve as the servants of Christ, trying to carry out the will of God. Ephesians 6 verse 7, In this day of disobedience and insubordination, any believers who work according to God's rules will shine as a light in a dark place. Why will a believer extend himself to this extent? It is because he is serving the Lord and not men. Ephesians 6 verse 8, in this verse the matter of wages is now mentioned. They may be grossly inadequate down here, but we are given assurance that if our service has been unto the Lord, 
he will acknowledge such and repay accordingly. No man will be paid less than he deserves. Ephesians 6 verse 9, The masters or employers are now addressed. They are instructed to act in the same manner to their employees. They must not threaten them with undue force or unjust retaliation. They are reminded that they also have a master in heaven and he is no respecter of persons. He has no favorites. The Christian Conflict, The Armor of God, Ephesians 6 verses 10-20 In this last section of the epistle, the believer finds himself engaged in fierce conflict. This is a spiritual conflict, in the heavenlies. Earthly weapons are of no avail here. Note the word, stand, is used three times. The weapons that are given to us are with one exception, all for defense. There is a very important meaning in all this. Most Christians believe that spiritual warfare is warfare of offensive action. This may be true in some areas of the Christian life, but this is not the picture here. This warfare is waged against us by Satan and his hosts, the reason for this is because we belong to Christ. In our unregenerate days, we belong to Satan, but Christ defeated him and rescued him from his powers and control. This formidable enemy is constantly attacking us to prevent us from enjoying the spiritual blessings which are ours in Christ, see the previous chapter. In the face of these attacks, it is our duty to stand, to hold, and to maintain the spiritual blessings we have. If we understand the conflict in this way it will help us to appreciate its meaning. Ephesians 6 verse 10, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord. We cannot triumph in our own strength. Human resources and abilities are inadequate to withstand the devilish attacks. When properly armed in Christ, we can never be defeated. We must use the power of Christ's might, we must use the invincibility of His powers. The standard of His power in this age is, resurrection power, see Philippians 3 verse 10. No enemy, whether angelic, human, demonic, or satanic can prevail against it. This is the power and might that is at our disposal. Ephesians 6 verse 11, this verse tells us to, put on the complete, full armor of God. We must put on every part of God's armor. We must not leave off one part. Our formidable enemy is the God of this world, see 1 Corinthians 4 verse 4. The world lies in wickedness, in the wicked one, see 1 John 5 verse 19. Our enemy is a roaring lion, see 1 Peter 5 verse 8. He is an angel of light, see 2 Corinth 11 14. He was cast out of heaven, see Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 17. He is cast onto the earth, read Revelation 12 verse 9. Paul struggles with the world, flesh, and the devil. See 2 Corinthians chapters 4, 9, and 11. The truth can be found as we consider the replies of the Lord during His temptation. The reason for this instruction is that you might be able to stand against the cunning devices, schemes, methods, and stratagems of the devil. Satan, our adversary, is the attacker. We are the attacked, and to survive in this spiritual conflict we must use the whole armor of God. Note that the armor covers our front completely, there is no protection for our backs. We must face the enemy armed with the full armor of God and then and only then will we be able to stand against the cunning devices and schemes of the devil, the slanderer. James 4 verse 7 tells us to submit to God and resist the devil. Ephesians 6 verse 12, For a moment, Paul changes the figure of the soldier to that of a wrestler. This would teach us that our conflict is individual and personal. It is not a physical conflict, but a spiritual war. Next the enemy is described. These are demonic forces, hosts of fallen angels, evil spirits who wield tremendous powers. Though we cannot see them, we are constantly surrounded by hosts of wicked spirit beings. While these evil spirits cannot include a true believer, they can oppress and harass him. Ephesians 6 verse 13, we need to be constantly reminded to put on and keep on 24 hours a day, the whole armor of God. Therefore, 
Brethren and sisters, we must put on the whole armor of God as the conflict reaches new intensity, so that when the smoke of battle has cleared we may be found still standing victorious. The evil day is when the enemy seems to overwhelm us. Satan's attacks are never consistent, they come in waves of varying intensity, advancing then receding. He never leaves us alone for long, as Luke 4 verse 13 describes, which says, He left the Lord for a season. Ephesians 6 verse 14, the first piece of armor mentioned is the belt of truth. The loins speak of physical strength. Transferring this to the spiritual sphere, Peter talks of the loins of our mind. Chapter 1, verse 13 says that our mind and being must be saturated with God's Word. Psalm 119 The second piece of armor mentioned is the breastplate of righteousness. Every believer is clothed in the righteousness of God, see 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. But we must in turn show integrity and uprightness in our lives. If we are right in our relationship with God and man, Satan has nothing to shoot at. The breastplate is an important part of our armor, it protects the hearts and affections. When a man is wearing the breastplate of righteousness he is impregnable. Ephesians 6 verse 15, Our feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is a peculiar piece of equipment for war, the gospel of peace. This suggests a readiness to go forth with the gospel into enemy territory. When we relax in our tents we are in deadly peril. May we emulate the beautiful feet of the Savior on the mountains, bearing good tidings and publishing peace. Romans 10 verse 15 says, How beautiful are the feet! Ephesians 6 verse 16, Next comes the shield of faith. Above all, take up the shield of faith. Nothing is more important than the shield of faith. With it we are able to survive the flaming darts that Satan launches will hit the shield and fall harmlessly to the ground. Faith here is unshakable confidence in the Lord and His unchangeable Word. When temptations assail, when doubts threaten and shipwreck seems inevitable, faith looks up and says like Paul, I believe God. Ephesians 6 verse 17 the helmet of salvation is to protect the head. The helmet is the salvation that God provides. It is eternal. No matter how fierce the battle, the Christian is not daunted, because wrapped in God's salvation he knows that ultimately victory is assured. Faith in God preserves him from retreat or surrender. Romans 8 verse 31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Finally, the soldier takes the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This appears to be the only offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is sharper than any man-made sword, see Hebrews 4 verse 12. The classic illustration of the use of this sword is when the Lord used the Scripture in His encounter with Satan in the wilderness. The times when He quoted the Word of God, not at random. He used appropriate verses which the Holy Spirit gave him for the occasion, see Luke 4 verses 1-13. The source of victory is when, under the Spirit, we use verses which best suit the circumstances. Ephesians 6 verse 18, quote, Praying always, unceasing prayer, use every kind of prayer, prayer is not mentioned as part of the armor, but it surely could be included. This is the atmosphere in which the Christian soldier must live and breathe. It is the spirit in which he must put on the whole armor and face the foe. Without prayer, our life and warfare will be a disaster. The Christian soldier's prayer should not be sporadic or habitual. He should use all kinds of prayer, inclusive of public, private, contemplated, spontaneous, supplication and intercessory prayer, along with confession and humiliation, praise and thanksgiving. This kind of victorious prayer is, watching thereunto. We watch against drowsiness, mind-wandering, and preoccupation with other things. The prayer of the victorious Christian warrior is keen, alert, and concentrated. The prayer of the Christian soldier is uttered in unwearied perseverance, he keeps on asking, seeking, and knocking, see Matthew 7. 
the Christian soldier is continually engaged in supplicatory prayer for all saints fighting the good fight and for fellow soldiers in the thick of battle. Ephesians 6 verse 19, this final section contains a personal message and a benediction. Paul needed their prayers, he was writing from prison. Notice that he did not ask them to pray for an early release. He asked them to pray that when he opened his mouth in testimony that God would give him the right words. He wanted to make known the gospel with boldness, fearlessly. Ephesians 6 verse 20, Paul was the Lord's ambassador and he was in chains. Ambassadors usually are granted diplomatic immunity, they are not arrested nor imprisoned. But the Lord's ambassador was in chains. The particular part of Paul's message that stirred Jews to anger was the announcement that believing Jews and Gentiles were now formed into one new society, sharing equal privileges, and acknowledging Christ as head. Personal Greetings from the Apostle, Ephesians 6 verses 21-24 Ephesians 6 verse 21, Paul announces here that he will send Tychicus to them and he would tell them all the news about Paul. There are only four references to him in the New Testament. He came to them with high recommendations. He was a beloved brother and a faithful helper in the Lord. Ephesians 6 verse 22, when he met with them, he would bring them up to date concerning Paul's welfare in prison, and he would encourage them and remove any unnecessary fears they had for his safety. Ephesians 6 verses 23 to 24, these verses contain Paul's benediction for them. He asked, in true apostolic fashion, that peace and love and faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ would be their portion. Lastly, he wishes grace for all who sincerely love the Lord Jesus with an incorruptible love. The End